All right. Well, let's get started. We're ready to go. We good? Yes, okay. you're good. Well, uh, Sharon nicely mentioned that I'm I'm retired, and and yes, I wish I wish I was, but I'm not really. <laughs> so there's way too much to do with uh, our trees, Lexington, or tree board, which had a meeting this morning, which I didn't attend because there's too much to do. Uh, so a lot of things to do. Um, this uh, presentation was a poster originally, and I think uh, Sharon has made available copies of that. I did. I posted it in your uh, reminder email that you received okay. this morning. You had the link to the website, and then we'll also go ahead and put that up on Kentucky Fort News. Okay. It'll be there as well. Well, it was uh, originally put together by a dear friend, Bonnie Appleton, who is no longer with us. And um, that's why I honored her with that. And for, she's from Virginia Tech. And uh, there's now a, a scholarship set aside for her through the, through the tree fund. But she put this together. And it's also on the back of the poster. It says 24 ways to save your tree, of course. And then she did this 10 or so years ago. So since then, I've come up with a couple of more ways to save your tree as well, or kill your tree, as we take it. So uh, let's just get into the first slide and we'll, we'll try and go through. Uh, one of the more obvious things is we, we don't top trees. Um, so that's just an obvious thing. And, and we might have some more pictures of top trees as we go through here. So kind of scroll through and see what kind of horror slides I've shown here. So yeah, that's an obvious one that's been topped and retopped and, and maybe topped again. And I call these fast food trees because we see them at fast food restaurants like that. Uh, and then we, we get, uh, that's in Lexington, you know, and that's really sad when you see something like that. Of course, they're aristocrat pears. So what do we say about those? Go to it or not? Uh, we now know that pears are not the best trees to have around, but uh, there we go. There's another fast food tree. That's a honey locust or what used to be a honey locust. Um, so yeah, things like that. We know better than that because it's just going to, it takes so many reserves from the tree to, to re-sprout all of that new growth, and they decline after that. Uh, some trees can handle it for a few years, but they decay rapidly, and, and we so we don't top trees. That's good enough. So, <laughs> oh, there's, there's a few more, I, I think. Uh, go ahead. Oh, this was the when they topped them and, and raised them at the same time. So there wasn't much left of those. That, that was really cute. So, okay, second one, um, leave co-dominant leaders. Does everybody know what that means? I hope so. Uh, well, we've got a double lead going up in a tree. Um, maples, red maples especially, sugar maples are really bad for this. And of course we have too many red maples right now, which is another problem. Uh, and encourages um, growth like this, like a pear tree. There you go, thank you, Sharon. And go ahead and see what else we've got there. Oh yeah, that's what happens to that tree eventually. And that's included bark uh, in there. And people say, oh, my tree got hit by lightning. No, it wasn't lightning, it's just included bark. It's a normal thing. Uh, the, the tree is just grown with a poor central lead. And you very rarely see this in a forest, but you will see it in nursery grown trees and trees that are planted out in full yards. But to look in a forest, you, you can't find this happening hardly. So again, one way we can mess up trees, but yes, another pear tree. And oh, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and I've got more pictures, but my wife wouldn't put them in there for me. So that's it. So co-dominant leads, you can see where two leads or three there off to the side. Yeah. And um, as those grow in diameter, they're going to push against each other. And this, there's always gravity and then they fall apart. So we prune trees with a single leader or we give them enough room to grow. So that's good. You're, you're quick on me now. We're, we, you know, she keeps moving me along. <laughs> so uh, number three, uh, leave crossing branches to rub each other. And, and, you know, the bark protects the branches. Bark protects the tree and is the protective layer. It's the skin of the tree. And when you break the skin, like we, when we break our skin, it's, it's, you're getting infected. And it's the same thing. So we don't want rubbing branches or crossing branches in trees, overlapping branches. And uh, these are a few that I've found <laughs> over time. And um, it just, so we prune the lesser of those out and, and, and keep going. 
So uh, we're having a lot of insects and disease. Uh, a lot of insects are imported. Uh, a lot of diseases are imported. We're having them right now. I mean, we can certainly talk for hours on either one of those. Uh, cedar hawthorn rust, we get a lot of calls about. It's really showy fungus. It doesn't really hurt the cedar trees that much, but it doesn't help your apple trees. So uh, I can't grow apples on my farm because I have cedar trees. So it's an issue. And I can't grow service berries either, really. So like emerald ash borer is one of our invasive insects. For those of you in Western Kentucky, watch out, it's coming your way. It's got most of the ashes in, in this area. We can treat it, but it's an expense item and people don't like expense items in trees. They like trees for free. So let's see what else we've got there. So we can prune those, a lot of things, diseases, we can prune them out. Uh, that's just an a old bore damage in, in a tree. Uh, keep going, let's see what we else we've got there. Okay, that's it. So just to recap there, we can prune uh, some disease damage out occasionally, like black knot and cherries and plums. Uh, but you want to be on the alert for things like that. So uh, there are other diseases that you can't prune out, like verticillium wilt in a maple. You'll see that, but then you can't really prune it out, you need to deal with that some other way. And sometimes you can't fix it at all. So, okay, um, pruning cuts and pruning paint has been a, a topic of discussion for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, we used to have little tar pots that we carried as arborists and we brushed them and, and treated every wound. And we know that's not good. So then people started treating trees with everything. Don't go any further yet. Okay. Um, started treating trees with everything they could imagine. We used driveway sealer, we used fence paint, we used creosote products, anything that was black, black spray paint. Um, you can get the little can of ortho spray paint, which is basically black spray paint. <laughs> and it lasts for a couple of weeks, but it does absolutely no good at all. So we said then it's a waste of time and it can be harmful to your, to your tree. So don't spray at all. So now that's what all the extension agents say all over the country, don't put anything on the wounds. Well, I'm sorry, extension agent. There are <laughs> things you can put on wounds that will help them. Scroll to the next one. That was a wound on the Kentucky coffee tree. This is a wound dressing that we use. It's kind of natural looking. It's made from trees, not from creosote products or petroleum, petroleum products. And it's called lac balsam. I should show a picture of the, but I don't have any with me right now. It's kind of olive green and it dries. It's a rubbery sealant. We know it helps the trees promote callus growth. We can get new growth right back from the cambium and just new bark forms right under it if we get to a fresh wound. Mm -hmm. So it it works, but um, somebody's got to use it, you know, and, and it's got to get popularized. And so that's just one that, that we know that, that works that we can use. And I've been using it for the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. So research and information lags behind what we see and, and what works a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So did, there are good wound dressings out there, at least one that I know of. That's called lac balsam. And uh, you can ask me where to get it later. Okay, uh, leave bro broken branches unpruned to encourage pests. Well, they encourage pests, they encourage fungi. Broken and splintered branches could be dangerous over time, of course, as they decay. Um, but in, in nature, we, you know, the, the trees have broken branches all the time, and they, I can't say heal eventually, they grow over old wounds. We really need to prune in, in the cities, but in, in, in nature, nobody prunes. So, and trees have handled this for broken branches for millions and millions of years. So it's not really a problem, but it can be a, an aesthetic issue. It can be a safety issue in, in urban areas. So we need to tend to these things. I like to leave broken branches on trees in wild because they make more habitat. And that's another thing we could talk about sometime is wildlife habitat and trees and what they support as we go on. Okay, next. Okay, this is a bad one that we, we need to talk about. Spray unapproved herbicides over the tree root zone. 
which weakens the trees. It stresses them. And I'm sorry for all you turf people out there. Yeah, turf is good, but it's, it doesn't go with trees. And it, it has its own entity and it's it supports, it has its own little ecosystem, but it's different than what a tree prefers. So trees are basically broadleaf weeds to, to an herbicide. And if you read on the herbicide label, which we get clients to do all the time <laughs> after the lawn company has come and sprayed and then the three days later, their trees have all curled up their leaves in response. And we say, okay, it says, well, they sprayed Trimac here, which is a combination of 2,4-D, Banville, Dicamba, MCCP. I mean, there's all kinds of things in there. And, and on every one of these, it says, do not spray anywhere near a desirable tree. So, you know, they're doing this all the time anyway, and that's, that's not cool. And it stresses trees. And we know root zones expand much further than the crown of the tree, but they're spraying it right up to the tree, which is even worse. So that's one reason we like mulch, which I think will be a topic here coming up soon. So go ahead and see what the next one is. So herbicide damage is showing a few contorted leaves, different uh, chemicals have different signs and symptoms that, that, that show up. So go ahead. And there's the little lawn sign of a of a friend that I, I blacked his name out. <laughs> so um, we we get lawn signs all the time, and I'll say they were there. But I'm I'm uh, I've been poisoned by these chemicals in, uh, in my younger years, and I'm very sensitive to them myself. So I I can't imagine dogs cats, children playing in yards that have been sprayed. It's a beautiful lawn, yes, but it's not good for them. So that's all I can say. Uh, damage roots and trunks with uh, lawn equipment happens all the time, mainly is bumping into it with the lawnmower. And of course now, since the advent of the weed eaters, uh, they're killing much more trees. So I've got a couple pictures of those. And uh, that was a nice little... Uh, swamp white oak that we planted in a park and I came back by and boom, it was just like that a couple of weeks later. Mm -hmm. um, so I treated it and, and it grew back. Here's another one, uh, just weed eater damage, uh, a yellow poplar. You can tell that by the bark, it's just straight. And it was planted too deep. You can see that because there's no root flare. We'll talk about that too. So, uh, but yeah, that'll kill the trees and we, we see it all the time. So mulch helps correct that, but see that tree is mulched and then they come in there and get, then get the weeds with the weed eater. They grow in the mulch. So mulch isn't the only answer. So we just say, stay the heck away from the trees with your weed eater and your mowers. And maybe hand pull some, uh, some weeds and it'll be good for you. Mm -hmm. uh, rip through the roots when digging trenches. Let's see what we've got for that. Uh, oh, yes, a big white pine that they were supposed to... Uh, tunnel under but they didn't tunnel under so they just dug a huge trench and, and laid a bunch of pipe and we see that all the time and then it's covered up and then the tree hangs in there for four or five years and then it either falls over or dies um, and or it reestablishes and it can do that but it's at that point it's really stressed because you've cut off basically half of the root system mm -hmm. or a large part of it and so we really need to get in there and do something for that tree right then. Or if, if we wait two or three years until we see the stress show up, it's really much too hard to try and bring a tree back than it is to, to work on it immediately or even better yet, do preventative maintenance before we, we know we're going to have to do some damage like that. So that's all. Don't cut the roots. What have I got there? Oh, yes. That's showing. This is a at the University of Kentucky and the Willow Oak Alley uh, that they've had to trench through in several places. And you see how shallow those roots are? Wow. They they're, are. they're in the upper six inches of the soil or even three and four inches. And they run everywhere. And it's a network of roots, which is really interesting for us on all these projects 
because all of these trees have now become one root mass. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. So they're actually helping each other survive. So maybe you can get away with a little bit more than you, you thought you could, but we, we still don't want to push that limit. So, uh, but go ahead and see what we've got. Okay, nothing else on that one. But the roots uh, on, on trees are amazingly shallow. The more compacted your soil is, which is most of our suburban yards right now, other than old Lexington soil or old original soil, which is really hard to find, uh, all the newer subdivisions, this is the only place the tree roots can grow because it's so compacted. So they grow right in the, the very little bit of topsoil that came with your sod, or they grow right on the ground surface. Then as they grow, they, they're exposed and they create more problems. So um, planting trees too close to houses, which reduces their adequate root zone. And, and then it's too close to your house because it grows. And people do this all the time. See what we found here for pictures. Oh yeah, there's the sugar maple that ate the house. <laughs> so, so, and then you've got to prune it and, and we can prune it away from the house, but then the, the gutters are full of leaves and you know, it's just, it's just better to not put a, a big tree there near a house. Um, so uh, big tree near a house, <laughs> inadequate root zone. Um, with a concrete curb. I don't know if that was cut at some point later or not, but then the wind blew. That's a, a hurricane picture. And it just laid it right over there on the house. So a uh, very shallow root zone, again, root obstructions there. And yeah, they, they go down. So uh, attach items to trees. Oh, we tie birdhouses to trees. We leave these stakes on the trees. Uh, we do all kinds of things. I have found many different things. So let's see what we found here. Um, come oh. on now. I had some pictures of that. Uh, I know I did. They weren't in there. That was just one click. That, I don't know what happened, but there were several pictures in there. Well, this is going to go quicker. <laughs> so somehow they got shorted out. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, leaving the stakes on the trees. Oh, I had five or six pictures in there. So that's weird that they just got deleted. Yeah. Um, or, I mean, certainly tree wrap on the trees. Uh, very few people use tree wrap anymore, but uh, the original stakes, I had pictures of the, the stakes uh, actually been worn off at the ground by the weed eaters, and they're still tied to the tree and, and girdling it. And then I had pictures of the stakes being there, and there no no tree being there where the... <laughs> The trees were died and gone, but the stake was still there and they're still mowing around it. You know, so you never know what you get into. Uh, but several trees that were, were girdled by wires left on. And I carry a pocket tool with me all the time. And here it is, my little Leatherman. And I have saved thousands of trees, but stopping, untwisting the wire, mm. cutting the wire pulling it out of the tree and then and go on. Um, so I may come to your neighborhood yet. We never know. We'll see. Go ahead. We'll see. We might find some more pictures in here. I think this was the next one. Okay. Well, we'll see what, what happened here. Uh, prune trees randomly leaving branch stubs. Uh, people don't know how to prune. Um, and see. So hopefully we've got some pictures. Let's see. Ah, yes. Lovely pin oak. A homeowner prune job. Or maybe just an uneducated tree climber, um, leaving stubs, and of course they'll sprout back out and then make a bigger mess than ever. Um, so just, we want to make proper pruning cuts. Um, we the, the term branch collar should come to mind and we want to prune at the branch collar, not inside the branch collar or outside of the branch collar, but right at the branch collar. So uh, we can talk about that later if we have time. So let's, let's go on and see if we've got anything else. Oh, yes, slightly over pruning trees. <laughs> so not leaving stubs, but too flush cut. And this is, they, you notice all the foliage is cleaned out of the inside of the tree. And this is, what's left is at the very end of the tree. This is poor limb engineering. 
trees want foliage all along, spaced along the limbs, because that damps uh, wind, weight, and everything else. So when you clean all that off, it leaves a little whip at the end, which we call it lion's tail pruning. And it's very improper and very deleterious to the trees. So we don't do anything like that. Of course, then if they live, they'll sucker back out with 10,000 suckers mm -hmm. trying to make up for what was taken off. And then you've got 10,000 suckers to deal with. So, all right. So make flush pruning cuts. Let's don't make flush pruning cuts, uh, which reduce wound pleasure. See if I've got a picture or two of those in here. Whoa, that's nice. Ah, yes. <laughs> the tree looks like it's kind of in agony there. Um, two flush pruning cuts. <laughs> Yet another pear tree. Um, I didn't pick on pear trees. These are just a bunch of old slides that I pulled together. So flip again. We'll see what else we've got. Well, that's here. Okay. Um, so yeah, flush cuts don't uh, callus over well. They'll callus over rapidly, but there's such a large wound. That's that's a, a big issue. So, okay, here's where I say leave the tree staked until the guy wire girdle the trunk. So maybe I've got my slides here. So let's look at that. Ah, there's some more slides. Okay. So we've got uh, this nice material here that's a uh, hose and wire on the left and it's the the stake is still there i think it's just hanging there and wire protected by a little bit of uh paper on on the right which uh didn't really work either so you know we want to remove stakes when i i generally say after one year uh, they're situated in the ground for larger trees you might want to wait two years but you want to adjust them or inspect them and make sure they're not growing into the tree uh, or the tree growing around around the wire. So go ahead, I probably got another picture or two. Yes, that's a kind of a sad thing. We see uh, polyester twine, uh, nylon wire, I mean, nylon things like that. Um, not good. If we were still using uh, hemp rope, it would, weather and, and rot and and not girdle a tree but we're using a lot of synthetics now and they are issues so we always want, we want to remove that from the tree so go ahead yeah one more okay yeah there's and there's the stake without the tree so but there's it's still got mulch and there's still <laughs> still going on but you never know and uh, yeah, that one's pretty well ingrown. I tried to save it though. Um, I hope it they didn't mind. I hope it did, also didn't break right after I left. Mm. So, and more ingrown. Oh, the tree on the right, a uh, tree on the left was a red maple. And I just happened to notice I was working across the street and I saw it and it's going into early fall color. And I thought, well, that tells me it's stressed. So I went, and look closer and, and the picture on the right is what I found. And all the stakes had been cut and the wire <laughs> wrapped up around the tree and, and left in a big jumbled mess up in the tree. Oh my goodness. So it was just, that was it. Uh, so another one Bonnie had mentioned, just leave wrapping on the, the, the tree to constrict the growth and, and rot bark. Uh, also, we know it hides insects under there or insects do hide under it uh, and can cause problems. We also know that it heats up the bark, more heat under tree wrap than without it. So not, not a good idea. She did the um, seminal work with, with that uh, as far as putting uh, thermometers under tree wrap and checking it with, with or without that. And it was always hotter under the tree wrap. Hmm. So not, not a good thing to do. But... Uh, yes, we still get uh, some sun scald on some trees, um, especially thin bark trees. So there are things you can do about that. Uh, maybe a loose burlap or something to shade the trunk for a year or so, uh, something like that, but not any tight tree wraps. So go ahead. Uh, 
excessive mulch. Has anybody seen excessive mulch <laughs> anywhere around here? Um, this was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago that she did this, and it was a problem then. So we, we call it now volcano mulching. We've tagged it. And, um, yeah, it's uh, it rots the bark off the base tree, holds moisture against the tree, encourages rodent damage. The biggest thing it does that we see on maples, especially on sweet gums, and on probably most all, all all the trees except oaks, really, it encourages girdling roots to form as that as that mulch composts, and roots will grow right out of that base of that tree up, and they'll grow in that mulch just around and around the tree. And then as the mulch dies out, they'll they'll dry out and die, but then they're there, they're starting. So we we end up with a with a lot of problems there. And a lot of trees I see are not salvageable when I go to look at them. Uh, but four or five years into it, I can say, okay, let's just check your tree and I'll pull the mulch away and and there are girdling roots as big as my finger. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can prune those off. But you've got to really know to do that. And if you don't, uh, you lose your tree. And that's not what we're about. We're about saving trees. So oval mulching causes girdling roots. That's a nice red maple I found uh, at a museum. <laughs> a nice big mulch bed, but over mulched at some point in its life and just grew a ton of roots around there. So proper mulching uh, done at, at the university. Of Kentucky. How about that? That's the Willow Oak LA mm -hmm. that now is a solid mulch mass all the way up to the buildings that are no longer there, all to right. the towers. So uh, this is a, you know, a, a, a fresh take. It was square mulching. Uh, it's okay, but it's again, it's, it's overdone. It's way up on the tree trunk. So not a good thing. Okay. Um, oh, boy. We used to recommend, people would say, well, maybe somebody recommended, I never did, um, put black plastic down for weed control or use the, better yet, use the weed fabrics. The, what, is that what we call it? We, landscape fabric mm -hmm. now. We call it landscape. So it's like it's necessary to have a proper landscape with no weeds and you put down this landscape fabric on your mulch. Well, it stops all biological activity. It's, I mean, they say you can breathe through it, water will run through it. I say, wrap your, wrap a layer around, around your head and see how well you can breathe through it. <laughs> <laughs> or to turn a hose on it and see how the water flows through it. It doesn't. Uh, and it, I mean, think of the earthworms that are down there trying to get up and get some organic material and take back down. Doesn't happen. You know, so we end up with a several inches layer of duff on top of that. It would be great if it was contributing to the tree, but it's not contributing to the tree. So we said, get rid of the plastic. And then they came up with the with the landscape fabric. And now we're saying, get rid of the landscape fabric too. So don't use any of them at all. Trees can't breathe under that stuff. It diverts water, causes all kinds of problems and, and stress for the tree. So we do not care for it. Uh, stack items on top of roots. Uh, Soil compaction is an issue. Um, yeah, go ahead and I've got a picture or two of that, I think. Yeah, oh yes, that's also at the university. <laughs> uh, this is where all the contractors want to park when we're doing a project on the building. So I think uh, Stacy has now figured that out and, and barred them from doing such things like that. We have a great uh, arborist and grounds manager at the university now, uh, Stacy Borden, who used to work for me. And I'm super pleased he's there mm -hmm. and doing great things. So mulching trees correctly, keeping trees off of where they where they shouldn't be. Uh, little soil compaction issues. Go ahead. And oh yeah, me and my penetrometer. We protected this tree. It's a huge Osage orange on a horse farm, and I put the yellow tape around it. Well, the bulldozer comes and he goes right through there. And he lifted the tape and drove through it. And then he came back to it and he ran about three times through it. And I said, what the hell are you trying to do? <laughs> this is, this is, we're protecting this tree root zone. You could go around. Well, you know, I, I go in straight lines. I go wherever I want. So, uh, but this is showing me balanced on my penetrometer and his tread. He's run over it three times before I caught him. 
and then I cannot get it into the ground. I mean, it's just after passing three times. So that's all that's all it takes. And go to the next slide. The next slide is me, and I'm I'm pushing right, you know, two feet out from from the treads, and it, I bury it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the original soil, and that's what we wanted to keep. Not that's why we want to keep bulldozer around. So works if we can protect areas, protect larger root zones. Uh, it's going to be really better than trying to fix it after it's done. That's another talk. <laughs> Uh, leave the root ball roping on to girdle the trunk. Oh, yes. Uh, go ahead. Uh, there's a, oh, yeah, that's, I can say that's an improperly planted Norway spruce. It's kind of exposed. It was, I thought people were going to come back and finish planting this tree, but no, they were done. And they left all the burlap around it. They left all the nylon twine. And they left the wire basket uh, on exposed and, and the stake. And then it's tied to the tree with polyester twine. So yeah, it's just uh, uh, it's a huge mess. Um, so yeah, that was uh, another fast food tree that I managed to. <laughs> Actually, I think the tree had done it on its own. It already grown over the whole thing. I just <laughs> cut the wires off and, and left the stakes uh, when I was getting something to eat. <laughs> so uh, some trees can make it. Uh, obviously, this one was irrigated. And that helps a whole lot. So, uh, but we really want to get that stuff off the trees. So, uh, go ahead. Plant near downspout to assure excessive water. Well, it could be plenty of water, but you know, when it rains, it uh, quite often now it pours, and you can get some erosion there. As, and it can encourage encourage shallow shallow root growth as well because we're putting too much water down at one point. That's just a point that Bonnie wanted to make uh, with irrigation in, in general, I think. And we have another slide or two about irrigation in here. Uh, so good or bad? Uh, well, this is where it's actually hitting the tree with force. We don't want irrigation heads aimed at trees, hitting trees with force. That is not wrong. I mean, it's not good because they do it every three days mm -hmm. or every two days or whatever. And um, it's a good way to start root rot. So that's actually a, a telephone pole right there mm -hmm. <laughs> that it's hitting, but there's a tree right behind it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And and there's a, a tree and here's the irrigation going around and, and the tree is dead for, for what reasons we don't know and been pulled out. Uh, probably over irrigation because mm -hmm. it's just soupy there. Right. I mean, it's really compacted soil. And on a building site, this is a new building site. It was a hotel in, in Texas I was staying at. And I was going out and checking out their <laughs> landscape and seeing what I could do. And this is what we found. Yeah. So uh, over irrigation. Um, irrigation companies are setting maybe for ideal turf. But they don't regard trees. And ideal for turf might be every three days you want to get some rain or some irrigation. Trees don't like it that regular and that much at that time. They like longer, deeper waterings to let stuff get in the ground. Uh, so that's, that's an issue. And how much rain do we like to get a week during the growing season? Everybody knows. In Kentucky, we say an, an inch a week is, is a good amount. Uh, some trees could use more, some less, but an, an inch a week will generally get you by. So that's what we like. Go ahead. So, oh yes, uh, leave the top of the wire basket to, in place to girdle roots. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of research. Boy, you're. I, I thought there was a picture. I, 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 I know. Mm -hmm. I would. I, I said, go ahead, mm -hmm. but then you got me. Um, so current standards are not to remove the whole basket because you can lose your your root ball current planting standards are get the tree in the ground and then cut off the top three or four rungs of, of the basket so it's not exposed cut off all the burlap all the synthetic twine everything you can get out of the hole get all the synthetics out <laughs> if you can loosen the outer edge of the root ball 
as well as, you know, because that's compacted as well. And talking, we could talk for another hour on tree transplanting, and we might want to do that someday about the how particular trees and tree roots are to 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 the new soil. Mm -hmm. So, but um, synthetic burlap is the same thing, uh, leaf treated or synthetic burlap. We found trees, um, found some huge uh, boxwoods that cost several hundred dollars. They were like five foot tall boxwoods planted and they were dying. And so we excavated with a, with our air knife and we found that they were in this really heavy, dark green burlap. And I, I called my dear friend, Bonnie, up and I said, Bonnie, what's this green stuff that's, that's, she said, well, that's treated burlap. And she had a name for it. It's, it's, it's copper, copper something, which is a fungicide. Mm -hmm. And it stops uh, the, the burlap from rotting. A side effect of that is it, it also stops tree roots from growing because this is what they coat the inside of the plastic containers with for to stop roots from going around, which doesn't really work, by the way. So, uh, but we, yeah. So treated burlap can be bad. Synthetic burlap is always bad when, and that needs to be removed totally whenever, whenever you get anything in it. So um, hopefully nurseries have picked up on that. We don't see too much of it anymore, but you never know. Something to be on guard against. There's your tree. It's a large pine. It was planted. And look at the original root ball. It's still there with the wire basket. It never put a root out of that. Mm -mm. And and it grew lateral roots um, in, in the mulch. And it held on for probably 20 years until we had a nice little blow. And um, it laid down. You know, and it... A lot of the other trees stayed, but they lost three of them, I think, at, at that one, wow. at that one farm. And then that that just showed what was going on. So, of course, we can't fix it at that point. Uh, this It's done. So I just said, well, beware of, of, of what's going to happen to the rest of the trees. They're very all likely the same. Well, that's all we can do. So dig hole too narrow and over a in backfill. So tight holes are not good. Big, big wide holes. What well, we want to dig a dish pan of a hole uh, when we're planting trees. And we don't want to use amendments in the backfill. I hate to say that because you know everybody says, well, I want to put my peat moss in there. I want to put everything else in there because that soil's so bad. It really needs help. And yes, the soil is so bad. It really needs help. But what that does is encourages the roots to grow right in that circle. And that encourages your girdling roots, you know, to, to come 10 years later and then become bad. And we've done tons of research on this. There's a lot of publications on girdling roots. And we see it happen way too much. And a lot of it's due to planting uh, trees and, and adding your, adding something to them. So we say, dig the bigger hole, uh, loosen the soil around it. If you don't dig it up, just loosen it. So we'll, uh, we'll use the air knife. We, we dig a hole. We actually blow it with the supersonic air knife. Something for you all to look up if you don't know what that is. And then we blow little radial rays around the tree if it's really compacted soil. And from the hole, so it looks like a, a starburst, and roots can get out into that. So we want the roots to get out, not to go out, hit a heavy clay soil, and then turn. So we want them to get out as much as we can. That's what we're after. And uh, some little girdling roots. A tree planted way too deep. That's all. Mm -hmm. uh, we want we want to see root flare at the bottom of the tree, and we so so here's dig a hole too deep or fill with gravel. I mean, people put gravel in the bottom of the planting holes. Yes, they do. I don't know why. They think it's going to collect water. Well, it doesn't. Uh, you just got a bunch of rock down there, uh, which is not good. Uh, so uh, we don't want to dig a hole too deep. We don't want to fill them with gravel and, and drown your trees. So go ahead and see if I got pictures there. Don't plant too deep. Yes. Uh, just rotted the bark right off the tree. 
you know, planted six or eight inches too deep. And a lot of that's a nursery problem. We see it coming from the nurseries already too deep. So they take the root ball and then they plant it at the depth of the root ball. And that's not the right place to plant it. Now we know, check that root flare or find the root flare and then plant to the correct depth. Mm -hmm. And you may only have two thirds of a root ball at the end, but you're going to be better successful than, than planting it six inches too deep. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna make it, it will, it will die. So, go ahead. Uh, okay, so we've been through 24. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, bonus. Uh, <laughs> what about if you fertilize with synthetic or inorganic fertilizers at planting? We, we don't recommend that anymore. People say, oh, get some 10, 10, 10 and put it around there. Um, let's don't do that. Let's try and use organic fertilizers and we don't want to put any inorganic stuff, even slow release, because it's not all slow release. It's only like 50% slow release, and then it can burn plants. So we, we don't want to fertilize at planting. Uh, and we don't want to fertilize anytime without really a soil test. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> From your local extension office. <laughs> right. So um, there's something, we use a lot of organic fertilizers, um, mainly, uh, Compost and, and biochar is the new thing, which is another good subject to talk about. Um, planting aids at some point. So go one more, see what we got there. I might have had one more bonus. Plant any tree you like, regardless of the location or species. How many people do that? <laughs> oh yeah, we, we're at the garden store and we see a nice tree or we're at the big box store and we see a nice tree and we'll take it and we'll plant it. Whatever the soil is, um, whatever the species is. So really, you know, let's, let's choose wisely and homeowners don't know what to choose a lot of times. And, and that's really what keeps me in business <laughs> is taking care of all their mistakes. So um, yeah, just something to, to keep in mind. We can plant a tree that gets too big. Uh, we can plant it next to the sidewalk the driveway, we can plant it next to the sewer line or the water line or the gas line. <laughs> um, lots of things we can do that are not good. So yet another talk, go ahead. So here's a uh, Professor Pricklethorn <laughs> and uh, he's a friend in Canada that says, I will plant the right tree in the right place. And he makes these kids do all these programs. He goes all around the schools. And he, he's great for this. And I, and I always say, now you need to add uh, the right tree, the right place, and then plant it correctly. So we just did a, a webinar with him that went out on uh, to all kinds of people, again, arborists, uh, using, talking about the, the supersonic air knife and, and the advantages of using that tool and, and helping trees. So... Um, go ahead. There might be something else there. The wrong tree for the site. Oh, yes. Okay. What is that tree? That's a river birch. <laughs> does that look like a river birch site? Where does a river birch belong? <laughs> Maybe by a river. By a river. Possibly. Yeah, that would be give you a clue, you think, but uh, not in a parking lot island with oh. a raised lid. Okay. That's all. She's just so hurried to get me through here. No, uh, I just, it was... <laughs> I had a cramp. I had a cramp in my finger. <laughs> so these are these are. Can you tell what kind of trees these are? These are pin oaks. Who, in their right mind, plants pin oaks under transmission lines? Somebody did, and they're gone now, of course. But uh, we can do better than that. So go ahead and see what else other surprises we've got. So the fact that. Big trees are worth more than little trees. They give us more environmentally. That, that doesn't mean plant a bigger tree. I like to plant smaller trees because they're cheaper. You have to let it, they adapt better to, to their new site. Uh, the small plant the smallest tree you can get away with. Um, some of us don't like to wait because we're old, but I'm still planting seedlings. Yeah. So um, so what do we say here? Uh, yeah, they're worth more than little trees. Environmentally, again, they have a larger environmental impact. Uh, they 
they do more for us. They do more environmental services for us. We know that. And it's all been researched to, to the hilt and we're finding out more all the time. Uh, Trees Louisville has a great project going with Cindy Sullivan and, and more there where they're working on the east side of town that's that's poor and working there. So it's uh, trees, well-maintained trees do add to property value, certainly. Besides, uh, I have clients that don't turn the air conditioning on all summer. They don't need to because they have trees. Mm -hmm. And it makes a huge difference. So go ahead. I just had to throw in a picture of the Angel Oak. I visited it a couple months ago. And uh, it is such an amazing tree. It's on it's near Hilton Head. As you're going there, city of Charleston, it's just it's on St. John's Island or John's Island. And it's a, it's an amazing, amazing tree. Nobody knows how old it is. It could be a thousand years old. It could be 1400 years old. They have all kinds of guesses, but no, nobody's drilled the tree, but it is a fantastic tree. So it's worth seeing. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what else have we got? Plant small. Sure. Plant little guys. You know, and then and then they, they grow. You know, no problem. Plan your trees. Just I, we could talk all day about that. Just plan your trees. Don't just plant them. So think about all the things that you want from the tree. And one of the things is we want to plant different things. We don't want to plant all a monoculture, and we see that way too much uh, in in different cities. Uh, I said, don't be afraid to be different. Uh, look around your neighborhood, see what's doing well, what's not doing well. Uh, look down and up, up and down when you plant uh, because of utility underground and, and overhead. So now we call it one woman. But uh, so biodiversity is, is a key for our insects, for our birds, for peace of mind. Go on to the next one. Uh, select good quality trees. Sure, well pruned, well maintained, well grown trees from a reputable nursery. Uh, what is that, dude? That's that's echoes in there. One of my pups. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Uh, tree protection. Yes, for construction projects, let's get some tree protection zones in. We can call it, call it a tree protection zone. We can call it a root protection zone or a soil protection zone. Whatever you want to call it, fence it and enforce it. You know. Well, things to do. I'll protect from lightning. Um, I see trees. I mean, the big old bur oaks and blue ashes here have been hit by lightning. And they live, but then they decay. Um, so it's it's an issue with historic trees, at least. I like to install lightning rods in trees, which we do now do. It's mm -hmm. not cheap, but you cannot replace a four or 500-year-old tree. That's true. So we, we do that. And I've got several of them scheduled. Uh, it's really key to water your new trees when we plant them. Uh, keep them watered. Again, one inch of rain a week. If we don't get that, get out and water. So our Trees Lexington group has been out watering a lot of trees. Uh, and during this drought we've had over the last few weeks and, and all throughout summer. But that's the only way to keep them alive. You've got to water and you got to mulch. So, yes, please just don't forget. That's our... Tour to Trees group of cyclists. We plant trees wherever we go. We educate people about that. I've ridden in the Tour to Trees uh, 18 times. Wow. Uh, and they're 500 mile bike rides, not in one day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's a that was a cute use of a gator bag. Oops, sorry. There. Uh, we won't go back. I hope you got a glimpse of that in that one second shot. Uh, over mulched, but the the gator bag on top of it is a good way to water your trees. And it also protects them from weed eaters. So that's not a bad thing. But you don't want to leave them on all winter long. And then take them off, put them back on the spring. So use expert for, for tree care. Uh, look for certified arborists. ISA certified arborists uh, is, a, is a good way to do it. There are some certified arborists out there that are claimed to be certified arborists. They may not be. So it's good to check up on people. Uh, but anyway, that's one thing to do. And uh, it's one of our climbers up a big sycamore. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Support biodiversity. Yes, the bugs eat your trees. But hey, the bugs are food for the birds. 
So, uh, though not much is going to eat a hickory horn devil that's six <laughs> inches long. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> but uh, we love seeing all that stuff. And um, we now know uh, that, I mean, it takes thousands of caterpillars to raise a, a single nest of, of fledglings to, to flight. Uh, so, it's just, it's crazy the amount of stuff they, they need to eat. So uh, there's a lot of books out there on that. Um, I, I can't think of the author right now, but I know him. I can't think of it. So um, somebody will come up with that, hopefully, and say, Dave, you know the book. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, let's see. What have we got? A broken branch hanging there. Too many pin oaks. Okay. That was, uh, yeah, there's, they're declining. Uh, and Lexington planted way too many pin oaks. Uh, back in the 50s, probably, yeah. uh, 40s, 30s, right. and uh, now our, our whole canopy is declining, and and where it used to be shady entire roads along Tahoma and Shinoe when I came to town to visit my grandparents 60 years ago, uh, now they're all gone. Yeah. Uh, so we've replaced with a, which a, with a bunch of diversity, which is a good thing. It's not the stately look that you had before, but it's it's going to last you much longer. So uh, too many of any one thing is going to be a problem. Go ahead. Uh, just spotted purple I have found it in my yard that it just hatched out. It was friendly. So you never know. We have all kinds of things. Uh, we had too many pin oaks. We went from too many pin oaks to too many pear trees. So stop planting pears. Uh, <laughs> That's good. Now, what what else have we got here? Uh, red maple, beautiful tree. They're coming into their own right now. They're fantastic. We got way too many of them. Thirty percent of Lexington trees, street trees, are are pear trees. So when we get a bug here, that uh, like the Asian longhorn borer, that its its favorite host is the red maple, uh, and it could come anytime. We're going to be hit really hard. Right. So we don't want any more red maples if we can help it. So go ahead. Too many red maples. Start talking about. Okay. So now we have too many red maples. Okay, we talked about that. Go ahead. Making sure your investment pays off. So it takes about fifteen years for a tree. I mean, if you plant a tree and it costs you five hundred bucks, it's going to take a long time for you to get that many environmental benefits back from that. Maybe 15, maybe 20 years, depends on how fast they grow. So the longer they live, the better they're going to do for you and the environment. Uh, cities need to be thinking about that. And, and they want to be cared for on a regular program, and they want to be in good condition. So there's everything we can do. Just got to think about and plan, plan your tree community to, to get good investment. Uh, Low bid only works as specific cases are established and followed. Okay, yes. I mean, you can say, uh, I'm, I'm planting a two inch tree. Well, you can plant a crappy two inch tree or you can plant a good looking two inch tree. Uh, you can plant a two inch tree that's um, bald and burlap or plant a two inch tree that's in a container. That container's going to have a rough time getting established. So, a lot harder time to get that established than a, than a bald and burlap tree. Yes, but they're cheaper. So, you get what you pay for. Yeah, maybe. Never know. Go ahead. So understanding tree biology, really important. And my forestry background really helped me realize that. And just knowing what trees grow where naturally. And people don't realize that. So know your trees, know your species, know what's typical of that species. Then we want to, to match that tree to the site. Uh, we don't want to plant... Um, Sour woods in, in the bluegrass area because they're not going to like because they like a pH of 5.5 and our pH is 6.5 to 7, mm -hmm. 7.5. So know what works. Uh, look at soil type, pH, compaction levels. Um, uh, is it an, an upland or lowland tree? So we see pin oaks planted at the top of the hill. We see pin oaks planted at the bottom of the hill. I see it all the time. The pin oak at the bottom of the hill is doing great. The pinnacle at the top of the hill looks like crap. 
because it's not getting enough water. Mm -hmm. Pin oaks or swamp oaks, Quercus palustris. Palustris means I like a swamp. Mm -hmm. Look to the name and, and learn about the trees. So there you go. Sometimes the site is so bad, nothing will grow there. Yeah, we do have sites like that. Um, so see what if I say something up there. Okay, well, that's that's an issue. We, we plant trees where we shouldn't plant trees. That's a pin oak. And then actually curve the new sidewalk around the tree, uh, which is illegal, by the way. You've got to have it the same, same width. And if you cut into the bank and made it the same width, you're okay. But they got away with it for so far. The tree's mm -hmm. probably dead by now. Anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, see, all the others are gone. So buy good quality trees. Uh, make sure you know what to do. And, and what a good quality tree is, proper branching structure is important. A lot of nurseries uh, just uh, prune trees for visual impact and not for structure. And it's very rare to find one that, that doesn't over prune their trees. So you get a bush mm -hmm. and then it stays a bush and, and then you need to prune it. And people don't know how to prune trees, so we end up with problems. So... Uh, that was a white fir that had been pruned back and pruned back and pruned back so many times. And they dug it. It had a, you know, a, a, a five inch trunk. And only they dug it with a like a four for a tiny little root ball, but it had been so, so pruned back. It might have made it, but it, it, that's not enough root balls to support a tree like that. Yeah. So it, you know, we planted it and it browned out, died. And, then we planted another one, but we found it, found one that we had a good enough root ball to, to make it live. Mm -hmm. So not a good proportion. Uh, container media tree and, you know, roots come out and go around and just grow around in that. And uh, that container media is not soil. It's a burnt mulch. Mm -hmm. And uh, they grow a nice root system, a nice fibrous root system. Um, but you can't plant them just like that. You need to really work with that root system. Yeah. So uh, there's methods to work with that. But the main thing is check for girdling roots, cut those off, plant the tree, see how it does. But you'll have to water it a lot more because it'll dry out a lot quicker than a, a ball of burlap tree. Transport and plant correctly. Sure. Uh, don't plant too, just a little, little things, follow guidelines, don't plant too deep. That's just a review. Uh, staking is not forever. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I want to leave some time for questions. That's a tree that was planted rather deep. That was at uh, Transylvania University. They planted a whole bunch of beautiful wands and cherry trees right there in the front yard. This is probably 15 years ago. Wow. And uh, yeah, and another tree that just totally wrapped around the roots, wrapping around it. Uh, if you cut those off and it'll might be okay, it might not, but we've got issues with that. So we never know that until we, this is this is what we see when we look underground. Mm -hmm. And that's where we use the supersonic air knife, just blow the soil away, doesn't hurt the roots, see what's going on, fix it the best we can, put the soil back. What do we got there? Oh, that's just a uh, sun skull on the southwest side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see a lot of that. Don't neglect your investment. Yes, we get so many grants. We'll get $10,000 grant to plant trees. So we go out and plant $10,000 worth of trees. We don't have any budget to work with those trees. So why don't we plant $9,000 worth of trees and save $1,000 for maintenance next year? Okay. Just a thought. Just a thought. You know. know where your roots are, how shallow they are, how deep they are. Know your root systems of your different trees. Really helps you over time. So, yeah. Uh, pin oaks can be shallow rooted, pin oaks can be <laughs> deeper rooted. But you know, when you're working with a sidewalk and you pull up all the roots on that sidewalk, it's not going to be good for the stability of that tree. Yeah. And um, what's underground? This is a seedling. This is an actual picture of a seedling from Don Marks. And this is the mycelia of mycorrhizal fungi that's below ground. And it's like, Expanding the tree seedling root by over like 10,000 times mm -hmm. absorption, more absorption, and that tree will do better. So, but so we went through this era of everybody and their brother making a, 
a mycorrhizal package and putting it in the ground and they're not native to here and they don't like it here and they may not match your species. So we say, now don't buy any mycorrhizae and, and add it to your planting mix. Uh, go out and collect some local mycorrhizae if you want and from a woods and bring it back and plant it in with your mix and your tree will say, hey, I like this stuff. Oh, okay. So this, that's the best way to do it. How to kill a tree. Had to throw that one in there. Uh, you know, excavate on both sides and and then, you know, it dies two years later. So uh, protect your trees. Notice a fence around that tree. That's a big uh, chinkapin oak. Just a beautiful big tree on one of our horse farms. And talked them into doing a big, a big fence around that. So trees benefit our community in many, many ways. Air quality, energy savings, uh, carbon sequestration. You know, just many, many benefits to the trees that are legion. So just know those, talk to your groups you're talking to about different things. Find out what concerns them and then talk to them about it, you know, about that particular area. It's always good to know all the different things about the camp. And <laughs> we made it through yeah. there. 